で、えー、音楽がかかる。There's music in the background.、えーまあ、And you see Porco sleeping.、えー I want you to take a look at the color coordination of the towel and the chair. For this piece, the color scheme was not done by Michio Yasuda, who had done all the color schemes for Ghibli's productions before that. But a rookie named Teruyo Tateyama, a pupil of Yasuda's. This is a photo taken at that time at a kind of discussion meeting of the Ghibli female staff. She is a good looking, rather listless woman. And her mentor, Yasuda, who recently died, is said to be the model for Gina. She wasn't exquisitely beautiful like Gina. It was just that Yasuda was so good at her work that even Miyazaki couldn't compete with her. For example, if they were discussing which color to use for the gold dust of Ashitaka in Princess Mononoke and Miyazaki says, let's use this color, she would say, of course not, you have terrible taste, this color is a lot better. Even if he insists and says, no, I think this one's better, she'd come right back with, don't be ridiculous, when Miyazaki sees the final draft and says, you were right. Then she would say, I told you, I'm always right. She always wins, just like that. He couldn't say anything after she'd actually applied the color. She was the master. This piece was done by her pupil and also used meticulous complex colors. The last scene where Porco and Curtis fight, for instance. During that fight scene, there's a moment when they fall into the water and bubbles come out from their mouths. They came up with a wonderful color for the bubbles, but that made Curtis's face stand out. In this scene, Porco's facial expression is more important and they needed to find a color that could make his face more prominent. So they had to compromise and change the color. She actually said that in an interview, for her, nothing happens by accident and it's all calculated. The towel and the deck chair have the same blue stripe design. I think he intentionally matched the color and design. Design of the deck chair and the towel. They were probably sold off from a luxury hotel or a cruise ship. I think that's why they have the same colors. And you see the bucket here? The bucket has a bottle inside. The bottleneck is a bit wider at the end, so you can tell that it's a bottle of champagne being cooled in a bucket. I think the ice has already melted. I first thought this was a bottle of wine for toasting after beating the Sky Pirates, but in Italy, chilling wine is the stupidest thing to do. You can hear Le Temps de Cerise from the radio. This is one of the theme songs, but I'll leave it for next week because it's a very complex topic. So, Porco is, here you go, sleeping with a magazine called、uh, Cinema on his face. On the cover of the magazine, you see the number 1929. So, you know this film is set in 1929. And if you read the books on the subject or Wikipedia, they also say that the story takes place in 1929. So, that's clear. Later in the film, there's a scene where Porco is supplying fuel and talking to the shopkeeper and says, Ah, the world depression. The world depression starts October 1929, but this story takes place in the summer, and so it doesn't make sense. Some people say this film is set in 1930 or in 1933, and the reason why there are two different theories is because later in the film, when Porco goes to buy a machine gun, he is offered to buy the patriotic national debt by the postman or the banker. And in Italy, the patriotic bond was only issued in 1930 and 1933, so some people assume that the story takes place in one of these years.
I personally think, or I take a stance, that it was set around 1930. In the official book, it also says it is set at the end of 1920s, and as the year 2000 is included in the 20th century in decimal arithmetic, 1930 can be included in the 1920s. Anyway, I think it's around that time. Also, the World Depression happened in October 1929. It took about a year to reach Italy, which was already depressed, and it made things much worse. So considering that history, I think 1930 makes more sense. I want everybody to take a look at the tie he's wearing. Yes, he's wearing a tie, and you may wonder why. But I'll talk about this later. And then the phone rings. Ring, ring, and you hear a voice that says, Porco, it's not good. But this is strange when you think about it. There couldn't have been an underwater cable, and he couldn't have had an antenna for a wireless phone. I'll tell you how phones work. I knew a taxi driver who worked at a phone office. I once got into a conversation with him, and this is the story he told me. You'd turn the handles when you use the old hand crank phones. That very act of cranking was actually generating electricity. And where does this electricity go? Well, definitely not to your phone. The electricity is connected with the telephone operator. It's connected to the operator far away from you. And if you turn the handles, the bell in front of your operator rings and the lamp turns on. And then the operator will answer the phone and say, who do you want to talk to? And you'll tell them the number. And the operator will press the numbers to ring the person at the other end. Then the button that the operator presses generates electricity, travels and rings the phone at the other end of the line of the receiver's house. Then the bell rings. So, what this means is that the phone in this era did not have any battery in it. So, it's either you generate the electricity and ring the phone on the other side, or the caller generates the electricity and rings yours. So, if Porco's phone rings, it means that the electricity was sent from the other end, where the operator generated it remotely. And so, you'd wonder if there was an underwater cable at that time, but nobody could answer that. Let me know if anyone knows the answer. By the way, the taxi driver who used to work at the telephone office was already over 70 when I met him. I assume that the phones in Gina's hotel went through the radio base station in that island. But I wonder how Porco's phone worked. The person on the phone says, Porco Rosso, fly immediately. Mama Yuto is here. And then, let's see, this is it. Porco picks up the phone, listens to it while lying down, and uses his feet to move his desk towards him. It's a great scene, and I want you to take note of his gloves. He even has a tie. Don't you think it's a bit odd? You'd think that he's very passionate about his work, but he only says, Mama Yuto, I don't work for low wages. But you see, he moves the desk towards him and turns off the radio to get down to work. So he's already motivated to get to work. Like I said, he's wearing a proper combat uniform, well, a pilot uniform and a tie, and he's even wearing gloves. He's fully geared up. The question is, does he wear this all the time? You'd think that he's the kind of guy who is always fully geared up, always ready, but that is not the case. You'll see what he usually dresses like later on in the film. <laughs> this is what he wears every day. <laughs> Tank top and shorts. That's all he wears every day. It's kind of obvious. So, in this first scene, at the very first scene, Porco already knows about the order. 
He knows he will receive a call soon and be ordered to prepare for the attack. That's why he's already geared up for his work, wearing a tie and gloves. For whatever reason, he even has champagne, chilled, ready to drink. The phone call was a lot later than he had expected, so he fell asleep. That's the real story behind this scene. Keep this in mind, because it's useful for later. Like I said, Porco even has his gloves on. 